Okay, welcome to the third and last part of our second language lecture. And in this part we will talk about syntactic processing. Okay, so we look at Noam Chomsky again. And one of the basic concepts of his theories was, or ideas, was how do humans produce an infinite number of new acceptable sentences? and really very rarely unacceptable sentences. This means not necessarily that they are always grammatically perfect, but usually people can understand each other, even if there are slight imperfections or grammatical mistakes or things like that. And um, the suggestion is that we are using a set of generative rules, and he called that the phrase structure grammar. And this phrase structure grammar is often represented as an inverted tree. And we will have a good look at this in this part and, and work our way through that. So let's have an example. Suppose we have the following sentence. The boy read a book. Then we have the sentence as the overarching structure. And we have one basic rule, a sentence consists of a so-called noun phrase and a verb phrase. So we can unpack the sentence into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And as a further rule, we know that the noun phrase consists at least of a noun and also possibly of an article for the noun. And we have both here. The boy is the noun phrase with the article and boy the noun noun. And then we have a further rule which says a verb phrase consists of a verb and possibly an additional noun phrase. So we have the verb, the boy read, and we could stop the sentence here and would be grammatically correct, so you'd see uh, this noun phrase is optional. And the noun phrase again is the same as this noun phrase, it has a potential article and a noun. So you can see this tree, inverted tree-like structure. You know, you have like the stem, the sentence, and then this branches out here. We have additional knowledge, or part of the set of rules is, to di dictate what words we can use for the different categories here. Like for articles, we can use the, or we can use a, or we can leave it empty. For noun, we can obviously use nouns like boy, book. For verb, we can use verbs like read, was, uh, drove, and things like that. So what we have here uh, is a set of actually simplified rules. And when we want to generate a sentence, then we mentally would start at S. And then we unpack the S, the sentence, into the noun phrase and the verb phrase. And then the noun phrase and the verb phrase are unpacked, and so forth. And for illustration, this is a rather reduced grammar. Real grammar is much more complex, has more rules, has much more complex um, elements as compared to just noun phrases and verb phrases. Some examples, which I just found on the web, to illustrate how complex such trees can be and that they are actually really used in, in everyday life. This is the tree for the sentence, um, the angry bear chased the frightened little squirrel. If you want to have a look at this in detail, just pause the video. Another example, these seven people include astronauts coming from France and Russia. You see some abbreviations we will even not use here. You can Google that if you use like uh, phrase uh, grammar or inverted tree and then D, T, C, D and, and so forth. You should be able to find what these mean. But we don't need that. It's just for illustration. Uh, the boy with red shorts kicked the ball and scored a goal, which is quite a typical sentence in everyday language, or if we read, uh, and you see how complex such trees can get. Okay, 
when we hear a sentence, then actually the same processes are at work. We try to generate such a tree from the input, from hearing or reading. And this construction of a tree, this unpicking the different elements, is called parsing. And for programming languages, for instance, it's also called a parser. Your writing of the code is then translated into machine code. So when we listen to something, when you listen to me right now, you must analyze the syntactical structure of the sentence I'm speaking and then in your mind come up with a tree. And in the end, you have to come up with one single tree. The problem is that there are often ambiguities, in particular early on in the listening, but sometimes even later when you hear the full sentence. Let's have a look at the following sentence. They are boring students. And this sentence has two different interpretations. One interpretation is that the students are boring. They are not very uh, fun students. No, they are boring students, lame students. And this would be the syntactical tree for that interpretation. They are the no noun. Are is the verb. They, the noun, is the students. The students are, and they are boring students. So we have a noun phrase with an adjective which describes the properties of the students and the noun as the students. The alternative interpretation is that they, in the sense of some people, let's say the lecturers, are boring, as the verb, the students. So the students are getting bored by the lecturers, let's say. And here we have the syntactical tree, which looks a little bit different. Now we have they is a noun, but it doesn't refer to the students, but to some other people. Our boring is uh, the verb, or the verb phrase, to better say. This is the auxiliary verb, are boring. And then students is the noun, the ones who are being bored by the others. And to disambiguate this, because if we just have that information, we can't um, we can't decide which interpretation is correct. We would need context for that, or further information like intonation, how we exactly speak the sentence. But that may be considered to be context as well. If we just read it without any further context, we can't decide. Lynn Fraser and Keith Rayner in the early 1980s proposed a model to explain the parsing process. And this model is called the Garden Path model and it's very popular and widespread. And the name comes from um, the fact that it tries to explain certain phenomena where people are misled in their interpretation or in colloquial terms are led up the garden path because you can construct certain types of sentences where a lot of people find it tricky to find the correct interpretation, the correct tree in the first reading. They have to re-read it a couple of times before they actually understand it. So their model proposes that we construct the tree gradually, bottom up, while hearing or reading the sentence. So like in the cohort theory, we would not wait until we heard everything. We start while we hear it. So in the beginning, we would directly start with the boy. We start with a tree and construct then partial trees with a sentence structure already. OK, we have the noun phrase. We don't know what's coming yet, but we already have this partial tree. What they propose is that we only construct one partial tree at a time. And this is uh, to reduce the load on working memory. And we do that even if several trees are possible. And if you remember, um, 
in the very beginning, uh, in the first language lecture, uh, at the end, we spoke about the influence of working memory on text comprehension. And there, uh, we said that people with a very high working memory capacity, or memory span, in the reading span task, are able to keep two syntactic trees online. So some people can do two partial trees, if they're really good. And the garden path model offers a solution to this problem when we can construct different trees to which tree we actually choose and construct. And what they say is, well, we choose the simplest syntactic structure, which makes some sense, of course, it's the most parsimonious solution. However, when you see these complex trees, the question is, what is the simplest one? And they uh, proposed two rules or two assumptions for that. One is called minimal attachment, and we will have a closer look at that in a moment, and the other one is called late closure. Okay, so minimal attachment. What does that mean? And um, the idea of minimal attachment is that we choose that tree which has the smallest number of nodes. And nodes are these like verb phrase, noun, article, these boxes in the diagrams which we had. Try to read that sentence and make sense of it. It is a perfectly grammatically correct English sentence and a lot of people struggle reading that correctly and parsing it correctly in the first time and some people even find it challenging after a couple of rounds. The horse pa raced past the barn fell. And the correct reading is the horse and then this is omitted, which was raced past the barn, fell. So that we have a main sentence, the horse fell, and then we have an, uh, a sentence introduced that, raced past the barn, the horse which was raced past the barn, fell. Let's have a look what our uh, parser wants to do here, when we follow the rules of minimal attachment. When we hear or read the sentence, we start with the. So it's an article, so we know we are in, we now, we know we are in a noun phrase. And when we are in a noun phrase, we need a noun. So our parser tries to look out for a noun. We hear or read horse, so we say, yeah, we are in a noun phrase. So the horse is our noun phrase. We automatically have to assume we are in a sentence. So, a sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So, we need a verb. So, our parser gets fishing for a verb. We hear or read raised. So, we have our verb. Then it goes on, past the barn. And this is what is called a prepositional phrase. You don't need to know these categories all in detail. It's about, here in the Cognitive Psychology lecture, about how such a parser can work in principle. And a prepositional phrase, like past the barn, works as an adjective or adverb. It uh, answers the question, where did the horse race? It just defines that and provides further information. So we have the horse raced the, sorry, the horse is a noun phrase, and then raised past the barn as the verb phrase. Everything good so far. And now we have the word fell. And the parser now finds it difficult to attach it to some part of this tree, because it's a closed, a perfectly closed tree, where there's no really point where it can attach. Now this is the original reading, and it has five notes. One, two, three, four, five notes. Now, after some reconsideration, our parser will realize, oh, the sentence should be, the horse fell. 
and not the other way. So, actually, fell is the verb of the sentence. So this is my verb phrase. The horse fell. And this, in the middle, raced past the barn, is a so-called reduced relative clause. So we have a new sentence, a relative clause, within the main sentence, with its own verb and prepositional phrase. And just by convention, this is attached to the noun phrase, because it explains a characteristic of the horse, namely the horse, that horse which was raced past the barn, that fell over. And when we now do another counting of the notes, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the final parsing is more complicated. It has seven notes instead of five notes in the original reading, and minimal attachment predicts that we pick the first one, because it has less notes. It has a simpler structure. The whole effect in this sentence depends on the ambiguity of the words raised, because it can be interpreted in two or can be coming from two different lexical categories, actually. It can be a past tense verb, the horse raced yesterday, or it can be what is called a passive participle. And here we have a verb which functions as an adjective. It describes the noun, the raced horse, like the beautiful horse, the blue, uh, not blue, that wasn't, the brown or white horse. And our parser at this stage does not know whether to interpret that as passive participle or as a verb. And verbs are more common than passive participle and will result in a simpler sentence, so we automatically assume that as a verb. If there is no ambiguity, we don't have difficulty reading such a sentence. Suppose the car driven past the barn crashed. No problem in reading that sentence. And the reason for that is that driven can only be the passive participle, so like the raced horse, the driven car. But it can't be the past tense, like the horse raced yesterday, because that would be drove. The car drove yesterday. So, such a sentence may seem a little bit constructed, but it helps in identifying how our parser works. And you try to find the situation, the boundary conditions, where it breaks down or has challenges to reveal the normal operation of that. There are other examples. You can just press the pause button and go through them one by one. I think they are from Wikipedia and, and see how that works. So let's have a look at an evaluation of the model. It's a rather simple model, but it actually can explain a good range of phenomena. But as usual, some assumptions turned out to be incorrect. And one is that the parsing itself is just based on syntactic information. And that semantic information, so meaning context, is only considered after the parsing has taken place. But there is good evidence and quite a few experiments which show that the semantic information, the context, is considered already during the parsing and not after we have parsed the whole sentence. Okay, to summarize this syntactic processing bit and this last part of the language, we have this phrase structure grammar as suggested by Chomsky, where we have a set of rules to create and understand. Okay, so a set of rules is used to create and sentences and to understand, to parse sentences. Um, 
and this phrase structure grammar can be used to uh, explain how we generate sentences and we understand sentences and they are illustrated by these inverted trees as we have seen before. It's important to note that this is only one version. There are loads of different variants and models and theories and even completely different types of grammar as compared to that. If you have any questions, please post them on the respective Blackboard Learn uh, discussion forums. Thanks a lot for listening and next week we will speak uh, about expertise and problem solving. And so far we only had one main topic per week and with language even across two weeks. From now on we will have two topics per week. Like you see, expertise and problem solving, they're a little bit related but also somewhat different. And with respect to the Gobe textbook, you will realize that the text that the chapters are only half as long as usual. So with respect to reading it will stay all the same, roughly thirty pages per week. Thank you for listening and hopefully see you next week.